Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. As part of our inspiring TED Talk series, spotlighting can't miss TED Talks and their key takeaways, today I explore Lorna Davis's famous 2019 TED Talk, A Guide to Collaborative Leadership. Welcome back to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. It's great to be with you again today, and I'm excited to explore with each of you the 2019 TED Talk by Lorna Davis titled, A Guide to Collaborative Leadership. What's the difference between heroes and leaders? In this insightful talk, Lorna Davis explains how our idolization of heroes is holding us back from solving big problems and shows why we need radical interdependence to make real change happen. I'll catch you on the flip side of this first clip. It was a fantastic new pink suit with big buttons and shoulder pads. It was 1997. And I was the new boss of Griffin's Foods, an iconic cookie and snacks company in New Zealand. It was my first time as the leader of a company, and I was on the stage to give a big speech about our ambitious new goals. I knew exactly what my call to action was, which was one in every four times a Kiwi eats a snack, it'll be one of ours. I emphasized that we knew how to measure our results and that our future was in our control. Embarrassingly enough, I finished up with, if not this, what? If not us, who? And if not now, when? I got this huge round of applause, and I was really, really pleased with myself. I wanted so much to be a good leader. I wanted to be followed by a devoted team. I wanted to be right. In short, I wanted to be a hero. A hero selling chips and biscuits in a pink suit. (laughs) What happened after that speech? Nothing. All of that applause did not lead to action. Nothing changed. Not because they didn't like me or the message. The problem was that no one knew what they were expected to do. And most importantly, they didn't know that I needed them. Now, you may think that this is a classic hero speech where I'm going to tell you that I overcame that obstacle and triumphed. Actually, I'm going to tell you that in a world as complex and interconnected as the one we live in, the idea that one person has the answer is ludicrous. It's not only ineffective, it's dangerous, because it leads us to believe that it's been solved by that hero, and we have no role. We don't need heroes. We need radical interdependence, which is just another way of saying we need each other, even though other people can be really difficult sometimes. I love this opening story and how vulnerable she is with the audience as she shares what she thought might be a triumph as an early leader earlier in her career, but rather ended up being something that fell a bit flat. Now, by all accounts, the, the speech that she made was very uh, impassioned and got a lot of reaction from the audience. But as she says towards the end of that first clip, nothing actually happened. Nobody actually did anything. So she came across as the hero uh, to her people, and they loved her vision, but there was no call to action. There was no shared ownership. 
they felt like she had the answer. She was going to be the hero to take them in this new direction and help them to, to accomplish this tremendous goal. And in fact, that just doesn't work. It, and, and it's dangerous when we send that kind of a message. And as she shares, uh, unfortunately, this is a, an all too common approach of leaders within organizations. So she'll spend the rest of her TED Talk really trying to debunk this myth of hero leadership and hero worship and and the problem with both of those and how they can hurt organizations and how we can get past it. I spent decades trying to work out how to be a good leader. I've lived in seven countries and five continents. And in recent years, I've spent a lot of time with the B Corp community, originally as a corporate participant and more recently as an ambassador. Now, B Corps are a group of companies who believe in business as a force for good. There's a tough certification with about 250 questions about your social and environmental performance. You must legally declare your intention to serve the community as well as your shareholders, and you must sign the Declaration of Interdependence. Now, one of the things that inspires me the most about the companies in this movement is that they see themselves as part of a whole system. It's sort of as if they imagine themselves on a big, flowing river of activity, where if they are, for example, soft drinks manufacturers, they understand that upstream from them, there's water and sugar and farmers that grow that sugar and plastic and metal and glass all of which flows into this thing that we call a company, which has financial results. And the flowing continues with consequences, some of them intended, like refreshment and hydration, and some unintended, like garbage and obesity. Spending time with leaders in this space has led me to see that true collaboration is possible, but it's subtle and it's complex, and the leaders in this space are doing a few things very differently from traditional heroic leaders. They set goals differently, they announce those goals differently, and they have a very different relationship with other people. So she moves into talking about her experience with B Corp organizations and how they view things from a systems approach rather than strictly providing value for shareholders and bringing value to the market. Now, now certainly those are important elements, um, but she talks about the upstream and downstream uh, elements that impact an organization and how an, an organization impacts the world and the surrounding community, the consumers, and viewing this as a cohesive whole, as, uh, as a collective system. Uh, that we need to understand those impacts. That is so vital, so important, and it's it's something, frankly, that most organizations and most leaders don't do. So being part of this B Corp uh, movement and making those commitments, uh, you know, it shows shows that she's going to be working towards this, and she tries to to bring her people, her her organization, along with this to see that to catch that vision and to see the value of that. Uh, regardless of whether an organization becomes a B Corp or or whatever, I think ultimately the lesson here, though, is let's remember that we're part of a system. Let's look upstream and downstream. Let's see how we're doing, uh, how what we're doing impacts uh, the world around us. Let's begin with the first difference. A hero sets a goal that can be individually delivered and neatly measured. You can recognize a heroic goal. They use terms like revenue and market share and are often competitive. I mean, remember Pink Suit Day? Interdependent leaders, on the other hand, start with a goal that's really important but is actually impossible to achieve by one company or one person alone. I want to give you an example from the clothing industry, which produces 92 million tons of waste a year. Patagonia and Eileen Fisher are clothing manufacturers, both of them B Corps, both of them deeply committed to reducing waste. They don't see that their responsibility ends when a customer buys their clothes. Patagonia encourages you not to buy new clothes from them and will repair your old clothes for free. 
Eileen Fisher will pay you when you bring back your clothes and either sell them on or turn them into other clothes. While these two companies are competitive in some ways, they work together and with others in the industry to solve shared problems. They take responsibility for things that happen upstream as well. Around the world, there are around 300 million people who work from home in this industry. Most of them women, many of them in very difficult circumstances, with poor lighting, sewing on buttons, and doing detailed stitching. Until 2014, there was no protection for these workers. A group of companies got together with a not-for-profit called Nest. To create a set of standards that's now been adopted by the whole industry. Once you've seen problems like this, you can't unsee them. So you have to ask others to help you to solve them. These folks take interdependence as a given and said to me, "We don't compete on human rights." So she starts to lay out the difference between hero leaders and collaborative leaders. And I like the examples that she gives of, of Patagonia and you know how they view themselves as part of the larger market, and they see how they situ they're situated within the upstream and downstream impacts, and ultimately the, the leaders there understand the importance of being collaborative with other organizations within their industry. Now, a lot of times organizations wouldn't even think about、uh, trying to do that. Um, because their their main goal is profits and bringing value to shareholders, and 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 so they wouldn't even be thinking about these other externalities that they don't feel responsible for. The difference, though, between a hero leader、uh, who feels like they have to control everything and they have to be the ones、um, to th that everything flows through, collaborative leaders they recognize the inherent value, the necessity, even. Um, the requirement that they have to work with other people, that they don't have all the answers, that they can't do it themselves,、uh, and, and frankly, hero leaders are too insecure to rely that much on other people around them, and so they they try to have too tight of control, and that brings negative outcomes for the organization, and ultimately they're not going to have as good of solutions, and they certainly won't have the same kind of systems approach that is going to be necessary to solve a wider,、uh, large scale. Challenges and problems. The second big difference for collaborators is their willingness to declare their goals before they have a plan. Now, the hero only reveals their carefully crafted goal when the path to achieve it is clear. In fact, the role of the hero announcement is to set the stage for the big win. Hero announcements are full of triumph. Interdependent leaders, on the other hand, Want other people to help them, so their announcements are often an invitation for co-creation, and sometimes they're a call for help. At the North American division of the French food company Danone, I announced that we wanted to become a B Corp, and unlike Pink Suit Day, I had no plan to get there. I remember the day really clearly. Everybody in the room gasped. Because they knew we didn't have a plan, but they also knew that we had seen our role in the river that is the food system, and we wanted to make a change. Making that declaration without a plan meant that so many young people in our company stepped up to help us, and B Corps around us all rallied around. And the day we became a B Corp. Wasn't just the self-congratulatory moment of a hero company; it was more like a community celebration. Heroic leaders have a carefully crafted narrative and a care carefully crafted plan before they're ever going to make an announcement because they want to control everything related to the project, the initiative,、uh, whatever. Uh, think they see themselves as the expert, as the hero who's going to save the day, and so everything needs to flow through them. Now, collaborative leaders see it quite differently. In fact, they they know that they don't have all the answers, and therefore, how can they have a fully fleshed out plan before actually communicating their vision and their idea to their people in their organization? Because it has to be something they work at together. They need to create buy-in. They need to. 
to leverage the expertise and the genius of their people in order to flesh out the details of any plan that connects with the vision that they may have. So a collaborative leader will have a bold vision. Uh, they'll, they'll have a goal that they, they don't know how to get to and how to achieve it. Um, but rather they, they galvanize and they, they, uh, they bring about the excitement of their people to be involved in the process of planning out and figuring out uh, what they can do to achieve that, that goal, that moonshot that ultimately is going to help the organization succeed. And the, the collaborative leader also helps to situate the, their organization and this, in, this initiative, this project, whatever it may be, they help to situate it amidst this, the broader system, uh, the, within the river, the upstream and downstream impacts. They frame it that way so their people can understand the purpose they can they can understand the, the greater uh, importance behind what they're doing. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership: Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Now, when you have goals that you can't achieve alone and you've told everyone about them, inevitably you land up at the third big difference which is how you see other people inside your company and outside. Heroes see everyone as a competitor or a follower. Heroes don't want input because they want to control everything because they want the credit. And you can see this in a typical hero meeting. Heroes like making speeches. People lean back in their chairs, maybe impressed, but not engaged. Interdependent leaders, on the other hand, understand that they need other people. They know that meetings are not just mindless calendar fillers. These are the most precious things you have. It's where people collaborate and communicate and share ideas. People lean forward in meetings like this, wondering where they might fit in. When I was in Shanghai in China, where I lived for six years running the craft foods business, selling, amongst other things, Oreo cookies. We had a problem with hero culture. We kept on launching new products that failed, and we would find out afterwards that everyone in the company knew they were going to fail. They just didn't feel free to tell us. So we changed the way we ran our innovation and planning meetings in two important ways. First of all, language went back to Chinese. Because even though everyone spoke great English, when I was in the room and the meeting was in English, they focused on me, and I was the foreigner, and I was the boss, and I apparently had that intimidating hero look. The second thing is we asked every single person in the meeting their opinion. And our understanding of the subtleties of the differences between American taste and Chinese taste in this case really improved and our new product success rate radically turned around, and we launched a lot of winners, including the now-famous green tea-flavored Oreos. Hero culture sneaks in everywhere. At Danone, we had a lot of great stuff happening in one part of the world, 
and we wanted it to spread to another part of the world. But when you put a person in business gear up in front of a group of people with PowerPoint, they have the urge to become sort of heroic, and they make everything look super shiny, and they don't tell the truth, and it's not compelling, and it's not even interesting. So we changed it, and we created these full-day marketplaces, kind of like a big bazaar. And everybody was dressed up in costume. Some people a little, some people a lot. And sellers had to man their stalls and sell their ideas as persuasively as possible. And people who were convinced bought them with fake checkbooks, creating just a bit of silliness with the environment. And a hat or a scarf drops people's guard and causes ideas to spread like wildfire. There's no recipe here, but time together has to be carefully. Curated and created so that people know that their their time is valuable and and important, and they can bring their best selves to the table. There's a fundamental difference between how heroic leaders treat their people and how collaborative leaders treat their people. Heroic leaders tend to see themselves as the answer to everything that ails the organization. They're the heroes. And so everyone around them is either a competitor or they're a follower, someone who just needs to do what they say because, after all, they have all the answers. They know the solutions. They just need to get everyone in line and to do what they tell them to do. Collaborative leaders, on the other hand, see the innate value in all of their people. They recognize how much unique contributions each individual can bring to the table, and they want to leverage that expertise. They want to leverage that value. They know that they don't have all the answers. They know they can't treat their people uh, simply condescending to them as and and bossing them around um, as followers, and they know that they can't manipulate them. Uh, And, and try to undermine them as competitors. They have to work together. There is no other way to a solution unless they're working collaboratively. And I love her story in Shanghai about uh, working at Kraft and working with her team around Oreos and other product launches. The reality is when we are heroic leader style, that other people will start to shut down because they're just waiting for us to say what we want them to do, because that's the culture, that's what they are experiencing, and they and they actually learn to realize uh, that it can be detrimental to them in their career if they try to speak up and speak out and try to share differing points of view, and so they become passive and they just wait for the leader to tell them what to do, uh, and that that leads to so many problems and failed product launches, uh, and you're simply not creative or innovative. And in that particular example, they didn't understand the nuance of of the Chinese market. Well, at least the leader didn't understand. The people did. They knew that the products would fail, but they didn't feel uh, emboldened and empowered to speak up. Uh, that's a failure of leadership. And when you're a hero leader, that is inevitably going to happen. When you are a collaborative leader and everyone understands that you expect them to speak up and speak out, you want everyone's input that their input is truly valued. Then you can actually have innovative approaches that will bring uh, bring products and services to the market that are going to be valued, and you'll be able to do it within a system where you understand the upstream and downstream、uh, role that your organization plays,、uh, so that you can. Uh, tackle larger challenges and problems. Hero culture is present right here in TED. This whole process makes it look like I think I'm a hero. So, just in case there's any doubt about the point that I'm trying to make, I want to apply these ideas in an area in which I have zero credibility and zero experience. I'm originally South African. And I'm deeply passionate about wildlife conservation, most particularly rhinos, those majestic creatures with big horns. Every day, three rhinos are killed because there are people who think that those horns are valuable, even though they're just made of the same stuff as hair and fingernails. It breaks my heart. Like all good recovering heroes, I did everything I could. To reduce this goal to something that I could do by myself, but clearly, 
stopping rhino poaching is a goal way too big for me. So I'm immediately in interdependence land. I'm declaring my goal on this stage. I found other people as passionate as I am and have asked if I can join them. And after today, there may be more. And we're now in the complex but inspiring process of learning how to work together. My dream is that one day someone will stand on the stage and tell you how radical interdependence saved my beloved rhinos. Here she gets even more vulnerable, and she shares her passion around rhinos and trying to protect rhinos, and recognizing her fundamental flaw in her thinking that initially, when she wanted to get involved, uh, she, you know, her, she was inclined to think, "Well, what can I do specifically? What can I do? And let's try to tackle this uh, on an individual level." For something that huge, that big of a problem and a challenge, it simply cannot be done individually. You have to work collectively, um, and so she she quickly realized that, and and now she, it, it's becoming her life mission that she wants to protect rhinos. And whether that resonates with you or not, whether that would be your life mission or purpose, uh, chances are you have something that you feel passionately about. If you have that thing, whether it's uh, within your personal life, in your work life, your career, within your organization that you feel passionately about, look for ways to connect. Uh, across disciplines, across areas, with people across organizations, um, and and think from a systems perspective on how can you really start to tackle this challenge. Uh, we're far too inclined to think individually and then become overwhelmed because we realize, yeah, there's there's not much we can do uh, to to address this problem uh, by ourselves, and and then we give up. Right? That's what often happens. Um, whether we're talking about society as a whole, within organizations, even within our family. Uh, and so we need to look for ways to collaborate. And I appreciate her sharing that. Why does hero culture persist, and why don't we work together more? Well, I don't know why everyone else does it, but I can tell you why I did it. Interdependence is a lot harder than being a hero. It requires us to be open and transparent and vulnerable, and that's not what traditional leaders have been trained to do. I thought being a hero would keep me safe. I thought that in the elevation and separation that comes from heroic leadership, that I would be untouchable. This is an illusion. The joy and success that comes from interdependence and vulnerability is worth the effort and the risk. And if we're going to solve the challenges that the world is facing today, we have no alternative. So we had better start getting good at it. Thank you. Thank you. The heroic leadership style does persist. It is the common approach in most organizations. I think it's the default of what many people have in their minds of what a successful leader is. Both the leader, as they think about what they should try to do uh, based on their past experience, as well as uh, people within our organization's followers, people who think, well, this is the type of leader I want to see. We're so used to, to thinking about heroic leadership style, despite all of the challenges and problems with that approach. And even if once we recognize it, we realize, yeah, this isn't very healthy. We need to do something different. It's so hard to get rid of the, the hero culture within an organization. It's pervasive. Uh, it, it, it extends uh, throughout most aspects of our life. Uh, and, and so we have to really challenge that. And she asked the question, well, why? Why do we keep on doing it? Why do we uphold and maintain this kind of a negative culture? And it's because it's easier. It's so much harder to do the work of collaborative leadership. It takes so much more concerted effort over a longer sustained period of time. And you, you're relying on other people. And anytime you're relying on other people, it, it's going to be messy. Sometimes you're going to take two steps forward, one step back, or one step forward, two steps back. Um, but you're going to learn along the way. And more importantly, you're going to generate buy-in amongst the people you're working with. So even if you do take those two, those two steps back, ultimately you're going to be better off because uh, in the long run, you're going to have people you can rely on. 
And every good leader needs a good team of people to rely on. I hope that you've enjoyed this TED Talk. I really have. I think it's it's super insightful. It shines a light on the stereotypical leadership style of heroic leadership that's all too common. It it uh, illustrates the importance of collaborative leadership and why really, we really need to foster that kind of an environment within our workplaces. And ultimately, I think it gives us something to shoot for as we lead our organizations. As always, thank you for joining me for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day, and I hope you have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.